All right, I'll kick this session off just with some brief introductions from the stage here um, to our panel. It's quite a large panel, this one. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to open this session quite early to questions from the floor. Um, but I'll let you know exactly when. Um, I'll start, like I say, with some brief introductions. On the end there, on the end seat, Brooks Entwistle, Managing Director and Chief Executive of Goldman Sachs, India. Next to him, Jim Quigley, Chief Executive Officer of Deloitte's USA. Next to him, someone I'm sure you all know here, Chris Goldpellacrishnan, Chief Executive and Managing Director of Infosys Technologies. Uh, Stephen Rolader, um, Chief Operating Officer for Accenture. Manish Kijwal, Senior Managing Director of Tamasek Holdings. And immediately on my left here, Wolfgang Lachmar, Chief Executive, Geo Post International, all the way from France. I, um, I was sitting in the newsroom about a month ago thinking, oh dear, not another crisis. And uh, my mind went back to uh, when I was in Fleet Street, and one of the first big crises I covered as a junior journalist was the 1987 crisis, which was followed by government slashing interest rates, hurling large amounts of liquidity at the markets, and making all sorts of statements about more regulation and more controls. Then my career took me to Singapore 10 years later, where I arrived two weeks before the Thai baht was devalued, and governments threw a huge amount of liquidity at the problem and made all sorts of noises about more control, more regulation, how we can change the rating agencies, and all the rest of it. Sitting on the flight this morning, um, I downloaded the G20 communique onto my laptop before we took off from Mumbai. And surprise, surprise, from almost top to bottom, uh, we've had the liquidity bit, now we've got the regulation bit. So this session is, is, is quite well timed, I think, just immediately after uh, the G20 communique and all the things that G20 want to put in place by March the 31st. And I think every single one of those regulations or new controls or supposed regulations or efforts that are going to be made by the authorities affect every single one of these major firms on the platform here. Um, I told Chris I'm going to pick on him first, so he's warned. Uh, as the man from Indian industry, from emphasis, uh, the consensus sitting through the early, part of the early afternoon sessions of the, of the conference here seems that people in the main think that India is reasonably better placed than some other countries to actually weather this storm. It was already correcting. Uh, the bank was already raising interest rates. The economy was overheating. You know, they were already in some kind of slow down correction phase. So I'm going to ask the panel just to give their little views, four or five minutes each, just on the, the main the main points they see coming out of this, and also hopefully to throw this forward where we go from here. So Chris, if I could start, ask you to start, kick that sure. off. Uh, thanks, Phil, and uh, good afternoon to every one of you. Uh, good afternoon to every one of you. Um, so the, the, the key word, um, Phil, is um, you know, slightly better placed. Uh, because um, you know, this is a phenomenon, this is a phenomenon that affects um, everyone, everywhere in some sense. You know, if you are doing any kind of business, uh, there is uh, impact. Uh, if I look at uh, the IT services industry in India, you know, Definitely, we have um, slowed down. Um, growth has come down. And um, if, if you then look forward, you know, that's what I want to look at. Um, you can divide you know, the path to normalcy into two parts. One is, first, to achieve stability. Second is to recovery, you know, to recovery to normalcy. And uh, your response also will get divided into two. You know, what do you do in this period till you get stability? And then what do you do when things start recovering? Uh, so to get to stability, uh, of course, a lot of other things have to happen. You know, like you said, uh, the governments are pumping in liquidity. You know, this uh, talk about regulation, et cetera. Uh, but from an from a organization perspective, from a company perspective, um, you have to look at um, uh, what can you do to um, 
manage your existing customers? Uh, what, do you, what can you do to actually get any growth that is possible under the circumstances? And you have to, of course, internally look at um, efficiency, cost control, etc. But I think the better companies would continue to invest in R&D, innovation, etc., rather than cutting those down, because um, longer term, you know, and I'll come to that, longer term, um, there are significant opportunities for any business, you know, and in IT services also. So you cannot, um, you cannot change that trajectory, or you cannot, um, you cannot, you, you, you have to invest in that recovery, and, and you have to invest in uh, getting back to normalcy. Now, beyond, beyond the, um, this period, that is when, when recovery comes, of course, I strongly believe that uh, IT services industry is uh, a better place. Um, the model, which is um, of um, distributing work around the world, leveraging delivery centers around the world, um, remote work, I think the, is the model for the future. And hence, um, you know, the, the, the services industry, the, the companies which have embraced this model, including, you know, many multinational companies have leveraged India through their captives, et cetera, I think would, would stand to benefit uh, because this model has become the mainstream uh, model. Now, longer term, you know, what are some of the things we have seen um, which, which, were, which were driving growth? Um, the addition of India, China, etc. I think we should not forget that. You know, we should not, in this environment, forget that. Um, the addition of uh, two billion consumers, it's, it's going to create growth opportunity for any organization, um, wealth creation for any, any organization. And, um, and productivity uh, will increase because you're adding more people to the global workforce, bringing them to mainstream, etc. So you have to prepare yourself for that. Technology has still a, a significant um, um, road ahead of it in terms of, um, in terms of uh, again, improvement in productivity, uh, creating of business, creation of business opportunities, et cetera. Um, technologies like biotechnology, nanotechnology, green technology. Uh, so investment in all these will, will create again, you know, significant opportunities. So those have not disappeared. Um, so I strongly believe that, you know, for IT services industry, there is opportunity because the model is um, the, the right model and, and growth will happen when normalcy returns. And then there are other opportunities like uh, I talked about, which will affect any industry today. Uh, and the market, expansion of markets will also be beneficial for any industry. So, my response is, um, you know, short term, there is a set of responses, focus on customer, focus on efficiency, continue to invest in R&D innovation, et cetera, and long term, there is significant growth opportunities. I think Indian companies, um, like you said, you know, are uh, slightly better off. I think they have uh, become more efficient. They have learned to compete in the global markets. Uh, they are emerging as strong players in the global markets. You are seeing cross-border acquisitions increasing. And, um, and since they are better off, and if they continue to focus on the long-term opportunities, I think they will come out of this much stronger. It's very early days for cross-border activity, though, isn't it, for India? It's, 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 it's only at the beginning of this globalization. Right, it hasn't been a smooth path up to now, has it, with some of these? Some yeah, it is, it is a faster way for organizations to um, accelerate their entry into new markets and new products and services, et cetera. Um, because Indian companies have higher growth rates uh, or higher margins, their market caps are higher and they're leveraging that. So that's what is happening. Manish, as an investor in Indian industry, do you go along with what um, Chris was saying in terms no, of the companies you invest in? I would agree a lot with what uh, Chris had to say. 
I think as, uh, as Tomasek, we invest, uh, we're typically a long-term investor, looking and investing behind those companies which uh, are extremely strong, uh, well-capitalized, or have the ability to become well-capitalized, but uh, have essentially then built on the local consumption uh, to become regional, if not global, leaders. I, I think, in short, when I look at the subject of this panel, uh, my sense is that this global financial crisis actually will not really affect uh, the ability of those Indian companies to change and affect uh, the global corporate landscape. Uh, I think at worst, the scarcity of capital that we see today, whether it's due to the squeeze, the credit markets, the frozen credit markets, or due to the lack of interest in the equity markets, may slow it down for 12, 24 months but I don't think it will change the, the perspective. Um, I, I say this because I, I, I think it's important to look back at the context. If you were here in India in 1998, uh, I think the, the scare, it was a very different perspective. Most of the companies at that time were probably just worried about the cheap Chinese import threat. Uh, I think uh, the country has grown leaps and bounds in these last 10 years. Um, I, I, I think a lot of the, uh, the steps they took for um, cutting costs, becoming far more efficient, developing their own uh, local R&D instead of just replicating and copying, have made many of the Indian companies uh, regional and global leaders. And I think when they have gone abroad and globalized, or tended to globalize, or at least have the first step to globalization, to your point, Phil, uh, it was done for the right reasons. It wasn't done to get a trophy asset. It was done, uh, for most cases, um, to get access to a market, to a product, to technology, to a brand, or just to build scale. Now, if you peel the onion a little bit and say, what are the factors which led these guys to go abroad or uh, create a more global landscape, I see four or five. And except for one, I don't see many of them changing, which goes back to why I believe, I agree with Chris that uh, I don't think the ability to change uh, the landscape has, has altered too much. Uh, I think, one, uh, the government uh, in, continued on its path of both uh, liberalization and there was strong economic growth. This economic growth is what allowed these companies to really build on the domestic consumption and build up scale such that they would be globally competitive. And I think the last thing was just the quality of the Indian entrepreneur. If you look at uh, it two decades ago versus the one today, you really see guys and individuals, especially as you see and benchmark them to individuals in companies around the world, taking not only a global vision, but being able to execute uh, to really uh, a, a global level. So the only other factor which I think really helped Indian companies the last 10 years, uh, uh, which has changed, is unfortunately the access to capital. Um, there was an incredible amount of access to capital uh, in the equity markets, the FIIs uh, fell in love with the India story. Uh, the credit markets were very benign. Uh, tons of foreign capital and domestic capital credit cap uh, uh, debt flowed to India. That has changed. The last three months, six months, uh, because of many exogenous factors, those credit markets have completely frozen. And the availability of capital to Indian companies, uh, it's reflected in the CDS spreads, the credit markets, have essentially gone to now. Uh, I, I think this easy access to access to capital also spoiled a few of the promoters in the last 10 years, a few of the companies. And I think if I look forward the next, uh, uh, the short term, the next 12, 24 months, uh, it'll really see the, the, the separation of the men from the boys. Uh, and I think uh, those companies which, uh, because of either weak operations or because of over leverage uh, resulted in, uh, well basically resulted in weak companies, you'll see those in distress, uh, often distress situation the last 12 months, and pro possibly of default, I would not rule out. But if I go back to those companies which have used the last 10 years, used the growth in the economy, worked on their scale, become globally competitive, uh, and essentially use the time to also de-lever the balance sheet, I think it's a superb time. Uh, so for those companies, I think their access, they already have access to the equity markets today, and I think their access to the credit markets will also become available relatively quickly. 
So in my mind, when I look forward, if you take the next 12 months aside, which I think will be painful for everyone, especially for the over-leveraged guys, uh, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity because even as for the question, the value of the Indian companies has fallen by 25 to 50%. Uh, the value of the targets that they can actually focus on has decreased by an equal amount. But those companies which have remained true to the knitting, uh, back to basics, and have uh, essentially healthy balance sheets, will be able to get the capacity uh, to, to take on um, uh, capital, both equity as well as debt, and be able to really expand their footprint in a very attractive manner in the, uh, in the years ahead. Wolfgang, we were chatting the other day about collaboration as opposed to cross-border M&A. Can you give us your view on how that, that can kind of work for India? At first, I would like to uh, um, say what I think are the two main uh, elements in, in this situation, decisive factors for, for success in, in those volatile time. The first is the, the behavior and the mindset of the, of the stakeholders. The second is the ability to find a strategy which is adapted to the situation. And uh, we, as a global network operator, um, very active in M&A, um, but very active even more in partnering, believe this is a very good answer uh, to the uh, capital constraints which uh, were mentioned. Um, the, if I look into in investments and uh, look, look as an international manager, investor into, into India, there are three areas you, you, you have to consider. The first is Indian companies investing abroad. And if I look into the foundations, uh, I see that there is activity and there is success. Out of the top 100 Indian companies, 31 did cross-border transactions in the last five to six years. 18 closed more than, than uh, three deals. Uh, India contributed more members to the Forbes Global uh, 2000 than any other country in the last four years. So the fundamentals uh, show that maybe the, there is a challenge and the, the way is not easy. There is success as well. Um, looking into the capital constraints, um, those who have not the, the uh, capital funds or access to capital might need to reassess their strategy. Go to a less capital in, invest or less capital intense modes. Those less capital intense modes, which are joint ventures, franchise agreements, um, agency agreements, uh, doing a startup instead of a, an acquisition, they might require as well a rethinking of the way how the company is managed, the way how the company uh, does its expansion. Um, I'm hearing very often the argument that um, doing it in a capital uh, light way and a partnership approach takes more time. We were able within two years to uh, convert from a domestic express parcel operator to a European leader and in another phase uh, from 2006 and 7, we established on a partner base a global network. I think it's a question of, of mindset, it's a question of, of willingness, and sometimes it's a question simply of, of limited funds. What are the, the success factors in, in going, going in, in this direction? Um, picking the right partner with the shared ambition, the shared values. Um, develop uh, as soon as possible mutual benefits, um, generating profits out of joint ventures, sharing knowledge, and develop an approach of, of respect, open-mindedness, and, and the ability to go for, for the third way, for not the one way or the other, to find a, the, the, common, the common way. If I look into what um, will impact the decisions of investors, um, I would also underline that the government spade plays a role. Um, as, a, as a transportation company, uh, for us, infrastructure is very important. In the uh, five-year plan, the 11th five-year plan, the government earmarked 550 billion investment in infrastructure. 
this morning we heard that accelerating that investment at a moment where the energy prices dropped, where the steel prices dropped, is a good opportunity and will create jobs and will unlock rural areas which might be the next low-cost uh, spots which a lot of people are seeking for in those difficult times. Okay, I keep hearing the word funding. Let's ask a banker. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Phil, and thanks to the, uh, the audience. It's terrific to be back. Um, I was struck in watching Dr. Kissinger today, um, who, you know, with his genius, was the real practitioner of realpolitik or realism approach to foreign policy. And it struck me that is exactly the tone that is necessary uh, to strike as it relates to how we think about the opportunities now and going forward, both for Indian corporates, really the topic of this panel, but also um, certainly around the world as well. Uh, we came under a fair amount of press last week by taking our growth rates down here in India. Uh, we took them down as low as 5.8% for fiscal year 2010. Um, and in the context of things, that does seem like a number that we haven't seen in some time, but I think Manisha's comments on the history here are important to keep in mind. It's also important to keep in mind that India is by no means unique in all of this. We actually took down the China growth rate Friday very quietly, um, and if you look out to 2009, we have a, a number which is 7.8%, which you've not seen a seven handle or a single digit number on China in a long time. And so I think keeping the relative importance here and the relative levels of the growth rate that we're looking at for this economy and this story are important. We all see what's going on in Europe. We all see what's going on in the US. Um, and in many ways, uh, I'm very grateful to be sitting here today uh, thinking about this market uh, versus many others. I do think some of these underpinning stories that we've all been on stage here for the last several years pumping um, in 06 and 07 when it was all about outbound acquisitions, all about unlimited access to capital, uh, some of these underpinnings are still here, the, the domestic consumption. Um, commodities, we had a scare in the year, but we've seen them come back down. We know we're exposed in the commodities front, but it's come back in a way that, uh, that is palatable. Inflation, uh, certainly a scare earlier, but we've seen that and we know where it is now. The underlying story here is still important. The notion of M&A, though, and I think I'm going to talk about just very quickly M&A and, and the funding piece of this. M&A um, has changed, and I think this is the most important point that I want to drive home today. We had spent the last two years as investment bankers really making a point of driving this outbound, the sky is the limits, um, India Inc. goes global story. If you could find a target, we could figure out a way to fund it and, and really drive home and you could do anything. And I think that really caught up in a lot of boardrooms and a lot of people were in believing that. If you think about what's happened over the course of the last year and even the last couple of months here, the M&A story is still intact, but it's changed dramatically. It's an inbound story now. Uh, if you think about the last couple of months, whether or not it's Telenor coming into the Unitech Telecom story, Daiichi Rambaxi, um, and others around it, you have interest continue in India. We're still going to have outbound situations, uh, and we're still thinking about that, but I think fundamentally we've changed the way that we're looking at this story because there are assets here, and it really relates to how promoters attack this opportunity. If there are assets that are non-core, if there are assets that are undervalued, if there are things that you could strike now to get capital uh, by selling something, there may be interested parties. And we're doing everything we can, as are all of our competitors, in drumming in interest globally in what we think is still a very intact India story. Um, on the funding piece of it, I think that's another piece that's worth, we're spending a little bit of time on. You know, ironically, if you look at the brochure for our session, uh, it talked about stock markets in India being down 25% shows the danger in printing a program about a month early uh, in an environment like this when you have the market here now down some 50 plus percent, uh, mid caps even lower. So market cap um, and the number of companies that we look at that are over a billion dollars in market cap, which is really our important indicator, roughly 75 or 80 now as opposed to double that certainly 10 months ago. Uh, but companies of that size drive transactions. They drive it globally and it is an important indicator. So. We are a victim of this lower market cap environment. It is a global environment. I think the point that was raised earlier about valuations also coming down elsewhere in the globe is important. So calibration is there, uh, but it's a matter by sector figuring out should you be buying overseas or do you have something here locally uh, that would be attractive to someone from another part of the world. We do think um, that it's very important as it relates to capital and to going after capital, whether or not it's in the M&A space by getting an asset out there and getting funding for it or raising uh, money in whatever form you can, that getting capital in the door is absolutely critical. And across the board here in India, it's gonna be a different story for different corporates, uh, but we're encouraging everyone uh, to strike wherever you can, because clearly we've seen this, we talked a lot about IPOs a year ago, 
that market's been gone for a year. Um, and we don't see that opening up anytime soon. So private equity, um, Manish's comments I think are valid there, but it's important to note that while there's still private equity coming here, and we ourselves are big investors, we've invested a couple billion dollars here over the time we've been on the ground, um, we too have slowed up like others. And so yes, new capital, uh, but people that have put money to work in the last year have struggled. So this outflow, uh, the FI outflow is there. Uh, it's going to continue. We had about 200 million outflow last week. Our hope is that on the basis of this event for the next couple of days that we'll have an inflow over the course of the next week and get some momentum around the story again. But we're, uh, we're still very much a victim of what's going on around the world. And I think it's important to go back to the underlying story and what we have to offer from this space. Thank you, Brooks. <clears throat> One of my rules of thumb is when my editors, uh, Brooks mentioned IPOs, when, when my editors in London call me up and say, Phil, I think we need an Indian IPO diary on the wire, you sell the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, can we have a view from the States, from Deloitte's perspective? I, I would just come at this uh, from a slightly different perspective. I think building on the comments that have been made and, and actually building on the comments that Phil started with, and that is, if the thesis as outlined in the program is, with the significant decline in the capital markets in India, how will India shape the corporate landscape going forward? The way that I would come at that is from a slightly different point of view and say that if we were to look at the declaration that came out of the G20 meeting uh, yesterday in Washington, I would ask the question, is India ready to join the corporate landscape and the principles that will shape that as we go forward? And I think that's how this new world order is going to evolve. And what I mean by that is even though it was convenient and comfortable and even a hoped for outcome that the financial turmoil that we saw forming in the U.S., everyone around the world wanted to say that's a problem made in America and that problem is going to stay in America and we're not going to be impacted by it. And what we've seen is that our global economy is very interdependent and it's tied together very tightly. And what I believe the corporate landscape is going to be shaped by is, in fact, the principles that are outlined in that declaration. And what we need is confidence in our capital markets. And we need all of the participants in this interdependent system to look at how they can play on that global stage in a very collaborative and a very effective way, complying with the principles that are outlined it's hard for us to see that world because, as you point out, Phil, we've seen many times declarations for we need more global regulation or we need more global cooperation, but yet we don't have a long list of examples where that's actually been functional. But I believe that the International Accounting Standards Board and IFRS actually represents a model that is scalable and a model that can, in fact, work in other environments. And I believe we are dramatically closer than we've ever been to a single set of high quality, globally accepted accounting standards established by a representative global body with a governance model over that that actually has the potential of becoming a scalable approach to you could take the declarations in this G20 uh, statement and then ask yourself, how would you enable that? Because you know that a regulator is going to derive power from a national government, and the regulator is going to have enforcement power derived from a national government. But are you willing to think about a world where sitting on top of that national regulator are a set of principles that have been developed by bodies like this G20 body, and then participating over the next 90 or 120 days in developing what those principles should look like and can national regulators, which are the first line of defense against a systemic risk such as we've experienced, but could a national regulator then look at the principles that are articulated by this more global body, and could they then, as citizens on a global stage participating in global markets, actually put in place regulation aligned with those principles? So I actually have a great deal of hope that we're in fact going to be effective at understanding how the current fallout occurred, how this crisis developed, and how we had some systemic risk that we just simply didn't have the transparency to really see. And can we take principles like transparency and accountability and sound regulation and integrity in financial reporting and international uh, cooperation, and can we take those kinds of principles to a whole new level and India can shape that future landscape by being a full participant, I believe, at the table 
while that evolves. And I think we're dramatically better off acknowledging that, in fact, this economy needs India at the table, that it is about the G20. It is no longer about the G7 or the G8. And that's how our capital markets, I think, are going to form and how capital is going to get allocated and how India will compete for capital on that global stage and be able to generate the confidence that it'll continue to be a magnet for capital. Because I agree with the notion that even though this is very interdependent, there are some fundamental differences of the Indian economy that allows you to talk about growth near term and long term at a much stronger pace than what will be experienced by the other markets. But that would be my view, not how is India going to shape the corporate landscape, but rather how is India going to join the newly shaped global landscape that's going to come from this G20 declaration and all of the work streams that hopefully will be completed in a constructive way by March 31st. Stephen, do you go along with that, a new global landscape? I do, I do, and I think, uh, I think any way you look at it in today's world, uh, the corporate landscape is going to be sh reshaped one way or the other, and, and Indian companies have to participate in that. We're going to see new players emerge. We're going to see some old corporate names go away. We're going to see flows of capital shift. And we're going to see new innovation centers continue to emerge. And I think Indian companies uh, have played a role in this, and they have to continue to play a role in this journey, if you will. I think how they, how they participate really is their choice. It's, it's either to survive or to thrive. And I think it's really important that, that they proactively choose one or the other. I think that, that there are some things that they can focus on, both externally and internally, to help them make that choice. If you look at externally, uh, there's about three, there's three areas of focus that we talk about. One is customer centricity. How do you get close to your customers? How do you understand their needs? And it's never more important than it is today as customer needs are changing every day. Um, they're going to, companies should stretch their sales and marketing organizations. Uh, one example is, is uh, Tata Tea, India's largest tea brand. And they recently outlined plans to access the Chinese and other Far East markets by launching new variants in water-soluble instant tea products. This is an idea that pushes a new product out, getting closer to new customers. In the short term, I think getting closer to customers will increase revenue, but in the long term, it positions you very well for the, for the eventual upturn that's going to happen. The, the second external priority that we talk about is getting close to your suppliers and your partners. Now is the time to identify those strategic cost-saving opportunities that everyone's focused on by establishing collaborative models with your suppliers. And one of the examples that, uh, that I've got is, is uh, Maruti Suzuki, who recently launched the one component, one gram drive to drive down costs, basically reaching out to every single one of their vendors and if you can take one gram of weight out of your components, you'll help us drive down the weight of our vehicles and thus the cost of our vehicles. And it's those kinds of relationships and those kinds of initiatives that are going to be creative ways to help link your suppliers uh, and your partners to your business. The third external priority is strategic acquisitions. And I think we've all seen examples of companies with strong balance sheets that are well positioned to move into the market in very strategic ways. And I think, uh, again, uh, companies, whether they're Indian companies or not, are going to change the, the, the corporate landscape by using their balance sheet more aggressively and more strategically as we move through this economic cycle. I think if you look at the internal priorities, the first one I talk about is leadership and people. I think in today's environment, again, whether you survive or whether you thrive depends on your leadership. And does your leadership connect and communicate with your organization? We have a COO council that we've established, 
And uh, we had a call about two weeks ago with 25 COOs from, uh, in global companies, and they all talked about the need to over-communicate what's happening in your company because people are nervous. People don't understand what's happening. And keeping your talent pool and the people that you have motivated, focused, and driven, energized, educated, and inspired is extremely important in today's environment. And I think it's going to separate the winners from the losers. I also think the talent acquisition around uh, in, in companies today is, is very important. How do you go out and acquire specific areas of talent that are going to contribute to your growth and your push as the upturn happens? Another internal priority is around metrics. And you know everyone has metrics and balance and, and uh, scorecards, uh, but but in today's environment, what I sense is that again those companies that are going to emerge from this uh, economic cycle and shape the the corporate landscape are going to focus on a very sh small number of metrics, but increase the short interval management of those metrics. I know that I've, I've seen some of our clients really focus on accelerating how often they're viewing their key metrics day in and day out. You've gone from quarterly to monthly to weekly to daily measurement and reporting of metrics. And that's what I mean by short interval management. And then the third priority is process and technology. And Chris talked about this, and I think it's really important. Companies in today's environment, and Indian companies are no exception, have to continue to root out weaknesses in their processes and technology and intensely focus on improvement, whether it's process or technology or a combination of both. I think it's really important that the R&D not stop there but continue because otherwise they'll be stagnant and they will just survive. They won't be able to thrive. So both external and internal areas of focus, Bill, is kind of kind of how I'd frame the response to the question. Okay. A lot of talk about balance sheet, using balance sheets more efficiently. Uh, reading through that G20 communique, it seems like there will be tighter accounting standards um, of things like off balance sheet and the efficiencies you can gain through that. Do you think that will hold up? I think there's no question that as part of this effort to try to accomplish the goal of transparency and accountability, dealing with the element of the systemic risk that many people felt built up off balance sheet is going to be addressed and I think addressed aggressively by the standard setters. And I think that what we need is for all the participants in these global capital markets to have an increased level of transparency if in fact what we believe part of the systemic risk that created the environment we have was excessive leverage, then we have to have all of the participants on the stage, those regulated, those non-regulated, be able to have a transparent way of monitoring, evaluating, understanding leverage if in fact we want to be able to manage and avoid the recurrence of the experience that we've had and dealing with off-balance sheet financing is going to be one of those. Manish is an investor in companies. Would you like to see greater control and more transparency? I think it actually depends, as I said, between the winners and the losers. Um, at an overall level, uh, if you look at the level of transparency, it's actually relatively high. And I think the degree of that has actually improved over the last six or seven years. I, I think what's uh, more important in this context today uh, in India, and I think it's come out to be true in the last 12 or 14 months, is actually the stuff which is not on the balance sheet. It's uh, the level of leverage, not just at the company level, but at the promoter level. And that, I think, as investors, is more worrying than the company itself. I mean, we keep talking about funding. Anyone got a view? I was at an ADB conference not too long ago in Manila. Awful lot of talk about the rating agencies, which affects funding, affects the ability of companies to raise funds, albeit in the equity market or the debt market. Anyone here got a view that the language in the communique is really quite strong? Uh, you know, uh, I forget what they said now, but they're very, very obviously going to take a very close look at the rating agencies and how they operate. Have you got a, a view on that, Brooks? I, I would say on the rating agencies piece of this, I mean, they are a critical component of all of this. Every single 
participant in this process, whether or not it's the former investment banks like ourselves, whether or not it's the rated agencies, the accounting firms, all of us are going through changes to adapt to this new environment that I think has been highlighted in this panel, and they are no different. And I think uh, that's critical whether or not it's the rating agencies locally in environments like we operate here in India, or certainly the global players. And so I think we are all under a scrutiny level, which is very high, appropriately, and you know I don't think people, anybody gets off from that. So I put them on the same list. I mean, from, from an operational standpoint, Phil, I think um, you know the, the rate. I've, I've seen the rating um, phenomena introduce itself in, in how companies, large global companies, are accessing capital and, and have them focus on, right now on defending that so that they can get the capital they need to continue to fund their operations. Uh, there's not a CFO, I think, that, that in a public company today that isn't weekly making calls to defend their rating so that they can get operational capital you know, to keep the operations going. What about risk management? I mean, risk management is, is, is vitally important. If we do see a fall off in perhaps financial market innovation, taking away some of the instruments or, or some of the instruments disappearing altogether, OTC trading taking maybe a back seat, it's certainly what seems to be, the authorities seem to be hinting at, that they're not actually very happy with this. I don't think they would probably move to regulate it, but I mean, how much impact is that going to have? Because the nature of that market is changing. The, avail the availability of those instruments is going to diminish, right? I, I think and this, is, this story is still being written, as we all know. Um, from the standpoint of the ability of firms to, to take risk, to um, have large principal operations on the balance sheet, uh, that is clearly going to be curtailed and as the process of being, is being done so. But I think one of the things that comes back in this topic of risk management is an important one here, and it's relevant for corporate India, it's relevant for all the financial institutions operating here and globally. That will continue to become a differentiator uh, among firms. Um, and those that can change and adapt um, and put systems in place that, um, that are not layered down so a risk management officer reporting lines are blurred and that information never gets to the top, this ability to communicate, collaborate, and get problems raised early I think is going to be the big differentiator. I think it was through this crisis. To some extent, I think that will continue going forward. So in, in some ways, there is the issue of what does that mean from a business opportunity standpoint, uh, but I also think it becomes a best practice that if you can do it and do it right, one of the things we'll look back on a year from now or two years from now, people that thrive in this will have figured out a way to get that perfect or as close to as possible. Chris, what's the industry doing? Yeah. Um, definitely, you know, there will be increased focus on risk management, but I feel that um, uh, there is an you know, overall failure of management processes and board processes. Because, see, CDS may not be the next innovation that is going to create a bubble, because it will get regulated. Um, you know, in the, in the dot-com era, um, everybody talked about uh, eyeballs and not revenues, right? Uh, that was the innovation at that point. Um, but Again, the failure of managing the risk of not having real revenues caused the problem. So, you know, you, you, cannot, you cannot anticipate what the next bubble is going to be and what will create those bubbles. Of course, the risk management has to be a focus area, but more importantly, you know, if, let's say, something is pointed out as a risk or raised as a risk, what does the management do? What does the board do? For example, you know, companies said 39, leverage of 39 is fine. Everybody knew of that, but that was allowed. Nobody questioned that. I think that's where we need to focus on. And, and then as an industry and as investors, we need to ask the question so that there is, there is a focus on risk and focus on implications of these new models and new innovations. Wolfgang, you talked about cross-border collaboration rather than m and I mean, how, how do you manage risk in that environment? I think you need a, a very sound uh, selection process. You need to have a, a lot of people involved in, in validating the files. Uh, um, we are taking a lot of time in uh, discussing with the partners or potential targets this, this situation, and if we don't feel comfortable 
we, we prefer not to, to walk, we prefer to walk away. Um, so far we have a, a lucky hand. Um, Just before I throw it over to the floor, I'm gonna throw it over to the floor in a minute. So get your questions ready, if we can get the microphones ready, please. Um, does anyone on the panel think there's a danger that this crisis will see the powers that be go too far? and stick their fingers in too far into the corporate and banking world and actually stymie growth. How big a risk do you think that is? Jim. Well, I think there's no question as we take a fresh look at regulatory models that there will be players on the stage who will quickly argue this is going to be excessive regulation and it's going to take away some of the entrepreneurship and some of the innovation that we're able to, frankly, be able to, over the last two decades, create enormous value and enormous number of jobs have been created as a product of that innovation. And so, will we find the right balance? Uh, I think so, just because the whole entrepreneurial attitude and fundamentals of capitalism will simply overwhelm the efforts on the part of some to quote what will feel like over-regulation. And I think we'll find a way to try to walk that fine line. Uh, will, once we get things going again, will the expansion be perhaps a little slower than it might have otherwise been? Had it been a completely unregulated environment that was allowed to exist? Probably. But I think the expansion needs to be also evaluated in the context of its sustainability. And I think that's going to cause some of our appetites and some of our attitudes and some of our practices to be tempered somewhat. Manish. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree with that. My, my sense always is the pendulum always swings far more dramatically than it should. And at times like this, it's very easy often to get over-regulated. It's not necessarily a bad thing from my perspective for a short term, because I think it wakes it up. The question is, do, you, do they let go? And I think the same thing actually applies to the earlier question on risk. I think it's very easy in today's time to be inundated with good risk consultant, good risk management. Uh, the worry as investors always is when the next bull market comes around, uh, you tend to forget that. So that I think is the is the going to. You know, it wasn't that long ago we put in Sarbanes-Oxley. I hope we take some of the lessons from that and apply it to the regulations that we're talking about here. Dear old socks, <laughs> we hear about socks every day. <laughs> Uh, let me just uh, add one thing. You know, um, I you know I agree with James actually. Uh, the balancing will happen. You know, maybe it, it will get overregulated, probably for a short period, but then it'll get corrected. I think what we have to worry about is actually will it slow down globalization. If it slows down globalization, I think that will have a significant impact. You know, protectionism increases. That level. because everybody is now worried about job losses in their company, job losses in their state, in their country, and so you, you start overreacting. I think that is probably going to be where the, where the challenge will be. And I think that is a much bigger risk than the, quote, excessive regulation, is just simply allowing protectionism to creep in right. and for us to take some significant steps back from the progress that has been made. I guess that's why G20 were very, very, they were quite vehement in what mm -hmm. they had to say about Doha and, and going back to the table on Doha and making that work. <coughs> Questions from the floor, please. Can you identify yourself? There's one here. Can you give us your name and your organization, please? I'm, uh, I'm Ashish Njanwala from Ramsaru. Uh, revival of the stock market will play a very important role in marginal acquisitions and also to keep the, the, your uh, debt low in the company. And the world has not seen this kind of a, a crisis since the, uh, since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, on 29th uh, October 1929, when the stock market collapsed, the Dow was trading at 450. In 1931, it came down to 45. And then it took as long as 1954 for Dow to get back to 450. So what do, uh, what do the experts think here? Will it take that kind of time for stock markets to revive? Because that will play a very, very important role. Stock market. <laughs> Who has to take the stock market? <laughs> <laughs> stock market experts. Go on, Brooks. <laughs> um, 
we and I are not in the business of trying to predict when this comes back <laughs> on a perfect day. Um, I would say that I agree. I think your assessment is an interesting one. Um, there is a fantastic book out by Amity Schles called The Forgotten Man, which is a relook at the Great Depression. She's a Council on Foreign Relations fellow. Um, and one is struck by reading this. The last question we talked about, the overregulation, trying new things, getting some stuff right, getting some stuff wrong, but throughout, and people forget that in 1936, 1937, you were back at square one in many cases, and things felt exactly like they did in 1929. Um, and I think all of us collectively, and that's why these gatherings are important, is to make sure that we all get around this, and so we don't let ourselves have these great time periods lapse, um, you know, like, like has happened in the past. Chris's point about um, things happening in the interim, things slowing down, companies having issues, communities having issues, other things rippling through the financial system all happen because it takes too long to get these things right, which is why this sense of realism that I mentioned earlier and the other topic here is clearly urgency. And all of us feel it, and anyone who doesn't, you know, clearly is not playing on the same stage. So I think that's a, uh, there's no date out there. If we could do that or if I could do that, um, you know, we perhaps had a different, uh, different discussion or a different profession. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's hope it's not as long as it was before. Any other questions? Yeah. Here at the front. Uh, hi, my name is Vinny Villas. I'm from a, a private equity firm in Mumbai. Uh, Two-part question. Number one, uh, capital inflows into India. Uh, we all talk about relative valuation, and typically right now the U.S. and the Jap Japan seem to be much more undervalued than the India. So the question is, why would capital inflows come into India within the 12 to 24 months that you were talking about? That's the first one. Uh, the second is the business model. Uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, the investment banking model has changed. And now there's an apprehension that whether people can actually exist, Goldman Sachs can actually live with the culture of a commercial bank. How is the business model in the US for investment banking going to change? Who wants to take the home for step. funds question? Well, I mean, I'll, talk, I'll take the capital inflow one because we, we continue to invest in, in India. I, and I think, um, I think it's important to realize that the demographics in India still pretend uh, that there is potential for significant growth. I mean, whether you look at the emerging middle class or you just look at the demographics of the population, you look at the potential in this country. I think anyone would, would be crazy to walk by the investments that, are, that they can make and the return that they can get in, in this country. So uh, I know from our country stand, uh, from our company standpoint, we're not stopping at all in terms of the investment here. And I think other global companies will probably take a similar view. I mean, wh when you're talking, you know, seven to eight percent GDP growth, that's still a wonderful place to invest capital any way you look at it. I can't address the Goldman Sachs thing, though. <laughs> I guess that one goes to me. Um, Wolfgang. I think two things. Uh, first, on India, we have a very simple thesis at the firm, and it's led by our chief executive officer, which is that we chase GDP growth. And that's why we're here, and that's why we have close to 3,000 people in the country between Mumbai and Bangalore. So that fundamental approach is not changing. Um, and we continue to add businesses and launch businesses, and we'll do so into the new year. Um, as it relates to the culture, and you brought up the culture, term, I'm, sure I'm glad you approached it in that way because that's absolutely key to managing through this change that we clearly are going through along with many of our competitors. Uh, whether or not it's becoming a bank holding company or whether or not it's a big merger with another one of our competitors, everybody's going through something. And I think ultimately it goes back to the culture issue. And if I look back on the last couple of months, uh, one of the things that really struck me was the fact that over the course of that time, we were getting almost daily, if not every couple of days, voicemails from Lloyd Blankfein, our CEO. And that wasn't just to the partners, it wasn't just to the managing directors, it was to the entire workforce. Here's what I'm doing today, here's what we're doing tomorrow, here's what I think, here's what we don't know, here's what we know. But he was communicating. And that piece of the culture of making sure that no matter where you were in the world, you were part of something that was going through a very difficult time, uh, helped people stay around it. So we, we have really gone overboard on communicating to our people at every point, um, and this, this, again, this is underway, this is work in process for all of us. Uh, but if we don't do that, to this talent point that was brought up, and I'm glad it was, we can't keep our people because they will just make a decision or a 
effect and come to the conclusion that this is not a business they want to be in anymore, not just a firm decision, and we've got to prevent people from leaving for those reasons. Yeah, okay. yeah in addition to the, to the size of the market, which is uh, enormous, um, India has advantages compared to the, to the other potential growth markets you can invest in. And as a, a Western company, we need to invest in the future. And as uh, the colleagues on the panel said, the, the growth rate is fantastic. The, the potential is enormous. There is, there is the language advantage, and there is the skilled work, workforce. And uh, I think that uh, also from a cultural compatibility, uh, I think Western uh, companies have a, a preference for, for India compared to, to others, although they will be also in the other, in the other markets. Yes, another one at the front. I'm Mike Johnston <coughs> from the Capital Group in the United States. Um, it wasn't too long ago, in fact, just in the last year, when many parties were concerned that sovereign wealth funds, if they invested in companies, would begin to direct those companies' uh, enterprise to ends that the uh, host country might not like. We now see the United States government owning pieces of nine big banks and talk of it owning pieces of automobile companies in America. Is anyone concerned that if, in fact, that continues, that if in this bailout the United States government and probably other governments are going to bail out parts of their companies, that that will result in a nationalism of the companies that is unwanted in a global scenario? In other words, if um, the United States government owns a piece of General Motors, will that try to keep jobs in the United States as opposed to going overseas? if taxpayers own a big hunk? Will it mean that banks uh, will be discouraged from making loans to non-American companies uh, if American companies are in need of the capital? In other words, is the intervention of ownership into the private sector by governments, whether it's sovereign wealth or others, a, uh, an unwanted development? Nationalization. How would you feel about the government owning great <laughs> chunks of companies that you <laughs> I, I think it's um, uh, simplistic uh, to give a one sort of an answer fits all uh, to as complex a question as that one. Uh, different entities behave very differently. Right? Uh, so just I'll take the SWF part of that question and then I'll try to relate it to how the government should or should not act in the US, or at least my perspective of it. Uh, many of the sovereign funds, actually, uh, the companies that they tend to control are primarily in their home markets. Uh, most of the scare the sovereign wealth funds came out uh, when there were foreign sovereign wealth funds investing in other countries. Uh, the proof of the pudding, actually, in the last 12 months has shown exactly the opposite, where most sovereign wealth funds have not taken active governance in almost any of the companies that they've invested in. Uh, if I look at the U.S. today, and, you know, as you said, most people call the Fed uh, the biggest sovereign wealth fund that there is. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I actually think their involvement today is one of criticality and survival. So the places where they're going in, uh, at least as far as the banking system is concerned, is asked to, to provide a set of liquidity in the system in order for the system not to collapse. And I think... Uh, that lead actually is followed in Europe and Asia and all over. I, I think when it starts getting more broader into, quote unquote, the real economy, with places like GM uh, or others, uh, that is a huge potential uh, flaw. But there I'd go back to what was said earlier by some of my fellow panelists is there's a balance. And, and, and my sense is while there might be some short-term decisions which might not be in terms of the benefit of the world as a whole, that the balance would return. Uh, and that the, the nations or the companies which feel cheated on the other side of the divide will push hard enough, whether that's automobiles or maybe uh, Chris has a perspective on IT and, uh, and outsourcing. I think those then involve not just a commercial and economic perspective, but a much greater level of social and political inputs. And I, I think there's always 
um, a momentum in times like this to overreact. But I, I'm optimistic, like other methods, that eventually sense will prevail and a certain balance will return. Anyone else got a view on that? Because they will disinvest eventually. They're taking yeah. chunks of these companies. Yeah, there will I, be some I, kind of dis so I feel you know right now it's uh, it's it's making sure that um, stability returns, making sure that confidence returns, making sure that uh, you know the you, you don't have a catastrophic failure across across the economy, and uh, I think what what is important is uh, you know that does not become a, a, a true you know, intervention at the governance level. So if the, if the governance level intervention does not happen, uh, I think you know, some of the things you said uh, will not. Will yeah, not I happen. agree. I think, I think you have to view this as a, as a financial injection. And, and the, the key word is governance. As Chris said, I, I, I think if you look at the participation of government in these bailouts, it's, it's a financial investment uh, without the governance to drive decisions at a board level or anything else. Face it, at the end of the day, every one of these companies is still going to have shareholders that they report to. They're still going to have the profit incentives that they've always had. The fact is they have uh, a source of funds from the government, and as long as we keep the governance light, I think it'll be fine. Uh, excuse me. Phil? Uh, Jacques Etienne de Certa from Outfront Technology. I have I read in the press yesterday that that's a question for Mr. Gopalakrishnan, by the way. I read in the uh, press yesterday that Infosys has decided to allow its staff to take a it encourages, in fact, to allow its staff to to take a a sabbatical for one year and to work for uh, NGOs. I find it extremely. Uh, creative way of being agile in these turbulent times. Could you expand on that? If the information I read in the press is correct, which might uh, not be. Yeah, it's... Uh, Thank it's, you. Yeah, it's, it's partially correct. Uh, the policy actually was introduced almost um, probably six months back, where we said that up to 50 people in the company, we are a 100,000 people organization, 50 people in the company any given year can take a sabbatical and, and work for an NGO. We felt that that is part of our uh, being a good corporate citizen. So it's a very, very small number. The, the, that policy was not you know, introduced now. Now that got linked, of course. You know, got linked and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a, our, way of, uh, of our, our way of managing uh, our uh, utilization, no. Sandeep Parikh from the Indian Institute of Management. Uh, just, just a little comment on the stickiness of regulations. I think there's a mention made about how we, we're going to see a time of over-regulation which will kind of go away. Um, I'll just take you back a couple of hundred years back after the South Sea bubble uh, in UK, private companies were banned for 100 years. Um, similarly, the uptick rule in the you know, short selling in the US um, came during the 1933-34 era. And it took 75 years to you know, uh, see sense and remove that rule. So I, I'm not very optimistic on, um, and I, I believe in the stickiness of poor regulation and wrong regulation. It was a statement rather than a question, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyone question right here? Yeah. <laughs> Chris Trow from the Strategic Executive Search Group in Shanghai. Uh, Chris and Stephen in particular uh, one of the themes that we've had uh, on this panel has been about what to do with leadership and keeping engagement in the company during difficult times. At a time when there's a lot of pressure to lay off people, when the economy is bad, how do you go out and take advantage of the opportunities to optimize leadership? Whether it's with succession planning internally, whether it's bringing in people from the outside who are strong and there are new opportunities. How do you go about that balance? And, and applying to anybody on the panel. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the first thing you have to start with is a, a very good understanding 
of what your talent needs are, right? You start with, all right, what, do, what holes do I have to fill? Where do I want to upgrade in terms of my talent pool? And what do I need to fill in terms of succession planning? Uh, you'd be surprised how many companies don't even have that, right? And so you miss an opportunity. You know, the, the, the saying goes, you should never miss a, uh, uh, an opportunity to improve in a great crisis, right? That this crisis actually has opportunities for people to improve their talent pool if they're positioned and understand where they want to invest. I think the, the companies that are kind of come out of this stronger are the ones that absolutely have clarity of vision on where they want to invest in, and upgrade their talent pool, where they want to increase training, where they want to put people that aren't performing out of their organization and upgrade their talent. And, and the people that do that decisively are going to be the winners and the ones that reshape the corporate landscape, I really think. Uh, so from uh, Infosys perspective, uh, clearly we see this as an opportunity to um, recruit um, some of the gaps and fill, recruit and fill some of the gaps we have. Uh, this is a great opportunity for recruitment of the right people. Um, we also will be focusing a lot on um, education, training, etc., because um, you know you have to keep the people engaged. Um, in the Indian context, generally, generally, uh, companies don't do layoffs and things like that, and uh, so you have to make sure that you keep the people engaged, and you keep them, um, keep them, you know, or make them prepared for the the upturn which is going to happen, and um, and 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 that also, you know, actually creates a positive um, image or positive brand. For the company uh, in the in the market, I think the other thing, just one point that I think you do when you do go through difficult times and, and people do leave firms, those that are left behind, you've got to put your arms around, and it's a, it's the perfect opportunity for battlefield promotions and getting junior people to step up and do things that in a in a regular environment with a lot of people above them they wouldn't be able to touch. And I think it's all about repositioning the people that are are still with you. In addition, to all the upgrade issues, which I think are very valid, it's a great time to go after other talent. But there's no question in talent management that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So <laughs> hug, your, uh, hug your top performers, and there's absolutely talent in the marketplace that wasn't there 60, 90, 120 days ago. And you have to just simply continue to compete and compete aggressively in that talent space. Absolutely. I can only agree to that. It's, it's very important to have very clear communication, uh, to raise the awareness about the situation give opportunities to talents, and leverage also the situation to, to implement new processes and new methodologies in, in working together. Okay, well I think in summary then, um, thank you gentlemen, I think in summary, a few points that came to my mind as we were chatting, um, Chris made the point about outsourcing, so, so important to the India economy, and that's gonna be a model that's gonna continue. There are other countries that people can go to, but certainly in India it seems like it's something that's going to continue. Access to capital obviously going to be a huge problem going forward. Possibly collaboration rather than M&A might be the answer to that for Indian corporates. Um, look for inbound and outbound, inbound as well as outbound M&A. Um, Rambaxi is a very good example, I think, of that. Um, accounting models that can work. It seems like we have a bit of a consensus here that we can get an accounting model globally that actually can work possibly even after SOGS. Um, Over-regulation, not seen as a big risk. That surprises me a little bit, I must say. I thought people would be much more nervous about over-regulation. Um, and finally, I think a very good point, good returns to be had in India. I think that was a sort of general consensus among the panel that India is still good value. There's still good opportunities here. So with that, I think we'll close up. I'll leave you with a delightful quote from the uh, Saudi finance minister that... Uh, we managed to get on the sidelines of the G7, uh, the G20 meeting, sorry. Uh, he said, there were lots of rumors we were here to pay the bill. There is no such thing. <laughs> so on, on that note, I think dinner is served outside, just the other, this small lobby here, out on the lawns. So thank you very much. Thank you to the panel.